Now Michelob hopes you enjoy the special of the week. First, there was Fleetwood Mac Part 1. Last week on the special of the week, you and untold millions of other conscientious radio listeners just like you gasped when Peter Green, John McVie, and Mick Fleetwood formed Fleetwood Mac. The trio, three of us, were playing some tracks, and because John and myself were playing on it, he just said, call it Fleetwood Mac. You sighed as Christine McVie joined her husband's rock and roll band. We went through those trials and tribulations through the years since then as obviously you must have heard about and your pulse raced as deserting musicians and deceiving magicians nearly forced Fleetwood Mac off the track it seems to me that the, the, the more problems we share together the, the tighter the bonds become what will happen next? Find out as this week the Robert W. Morgan Special of the Week proudly presents the exciting as thunder sequel to Fleetwood Mac Part 1, Fleetwood Mac Part 2. Monday morning you showed up. Fleetwood Mac. To hear him now, it's hard to believe that John McVie, Mick Fleetwood, and Christine McVie are veterans of the early 60s British blues revival. But that's because in 1975, with their rock career on the rocks, Fleetwood Mac added a pair of veterans from the early 60s San Francisco folk revival, Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham. But before Lindsey got into folk, he was rocking his folks. Yes, I was uh, raised in a nice community. You know, nice stable families, lived in the same place my whole life. I started playing guitar when I was about seven. And uh, my older brother, uh, Jeff, came home one day and said, hey, there's this new guy, Elvis Presley. And I, was, I couldn't visualize what he was talking about because he had seen pictures of him and he put on the single Heartbreak Hotel. And that was it, you know. But the thing is, he had great taste and he bought everything that ended up being uh, classic later on. That was a great way to start. It was very lucky to be so strongly influenced by that kind of music that early. I sing so many. It was a very singular solitary thing starting to play at a young age at that time i made perhaps the reason that i didn't share it was because when you play guitar at seven there's no one else around you know <laughs> to really get a group together with so i just learned and listened and played until i was about 18. i think subconsciously i was preparing for a career but uh, i don't think i really thought seriously about being an entertainer until I joined a rock and roll band just when I was 18, when I got out of high school. The group Lindsay joined when he got out of high school was called Fritz. Now, his career probably would have gone on the Fritz if it weren't for the band's other lead singer, a beautiful, ethereal young woman from Phoenix, Stevie Nicks. Soon, Stevie and Lindsay paired off, teamed up, and headed south for Los Angeles. There, they recorded an album ingeniously titled Buckingham Nicks, an album now remembered, along with the Alamo, only in Texas. It was very disheartening. There was a, a gentleman from Texas who was hearing the single don't let me down again in Texas and he thought that we were biggies you know just from the airplay it was getting in Texas and he couldn't believe it when he came back to LA you know it was like shattering for him to realize that we were just starving over here the public mixed Buckingham Knicks, so Lindsay tried to earn extra cash in his spare time through a variety of odd jobs. In fact, one of those jobs was extremely odd. That was very embarrassing, too, because as you can tell, I'm pretty soft-spoken and everything. And uh, I got this job trying to sell advertising space. I'd have to get up at 5 in the morning to call back east, right? And, hi, uh, this is, uh, and you'd give a fake name, and you'd give the name of the directory and uh, you'd say would you like to renew this year and half the people would say oh sure if we had it last year and you'd write them down and but there had not been the directory the year before so it was such a scam I couldn't really and it, you know I couldn't take that from one about a month I just I just got uh, too traumatized and I just wasn't cut out for that kind of thing 
Unfortunately, Fleetwood Mac had saved a place for Lindsay and Stevie. While looking for a new recording studio, they happened upon the very studio where Buckingham Nicks was recorded, where they heard the master tapes of that album. After a 10-year musical quest, Fleetwood Mac had finally found the sound they'd been searching for for so long. It must have been fate. Yes, fate. You know, it's always a case of that, it seems. Like something very simple happens and makes such a big difference. It is never that you suddenly become something and uh, that means you're ready for the big time. It's always some strange turn of events and then suddenly people start seeing you differently. And that's, that seems to be, from my point of view, what, what happened. Fleetwood Mac finds lovin' isn't that much fun after all, as rumors rock the band. Next, on the Special of the Week. I, I'm Robert W. Morgan with Fleetwood Mac on the Special of the Week. Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks had joined Fleetwood Mac to replace Bob Welch, who'd embarked on a solo career. For Stevie and Lindsey, this was their big chance. But for Fleetwood Mac, says Christine McBee, Stevie and Lindsey were a big risk. It was a big risk we took, you know, when Bob Welch left the band. We had a good living. We weren't making millions and millions of dollars. We were making a good living, though. And when Bob left, we didn't know what on earth was going to come out of the studio at the other end after Stevie and Lindsay had joined us, how it was going to turn out, and it was a real chance. But we didn't uh, comply to any formula. We just recorded the songs we liked and just hoped that everybody else liked them too. And so fortunately for us, everybody did, and we've just always gone on that way. Do you Christine wasn't really a blues player when she first started playing. She grew up with very melodic, probably classical influences and things like that. And, and Stevie and, and I did too in, in many ways before rock and roll came along. I mean, the, the basic sort of fundamental set of values was very similar, I think. That was good because it gave us a very strong core on which to ex expand rather than a whole bunch of divergent things that we had to try to bring together. We had something that was together that we could build on. The new Fleetwood Mac, Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, Christine McVie, Stevie Nicks, and Lindsey Buckingham, seemed like a musical marriage made in heaven. But unfortunately, heaven would have to wait. Buckingham and Nicks no longer had the knack, while Mr. and Mrs. McVie made a V-line away from each other. Breaking up is hard to do, but for Fleetwood Mac, breaking up was impossible. I mean, John and I have been divorced with three, is it three, two years, two and a half, three years. Um, we're better friends now than we ever were. I mean, we went through some really bad patches, you know, when we, were, when we actually had to play and work together at, at the onslaught of the separation and everything like that. Celia and Lindsay had a similar problem. But I think that we all felt so responsible for each other and such a big loyalty for the band itself that none of us could actually say, well, that's it, I'm leaving, you know. Rumors swirled about Fleetwood Mac the same way that Stevie Nicks swirls about the concert stage. The band good-naturedly called their biggest-selling album Rumors, but the fact remains that most of Fleetwood Mac's songs are broken-hearted melodies. You know, the Rumors album was certainly not a conscious effort to uh, hang out our dirty laundry at all. The fact that there were three writers and the fact that Stevie and I broke up halfway through the album and had been going together for a number of years and John and Chris were married and broke up during the middle of that album, that, that situation is pretty unique, I'd say. It's three of the four people that are in the relationships are writing all the songs, you know. I mean, what else are you going to write about? If those things are, are making me feel pain at the time, then that's what's going to come out, you know. So I think that there was always an, a sense that somewhere up here, while well, all of this dirt was down here somewhere, <laughs> that the music was certainly more important than what we were doing musically for people and for ourselves, really, because, you know, I mean, it's a great thing to be able to do. It's a great thing to be able to do. It makes you so happy <laughs> at times. It makes you so unhappy, too. <laughs> Lindsey Buckingham takes on the task of Tusk. We'll see if he has any tricks up his trunk next with Fleetwood Mac on the special of the week. I'm Robert W. Morton, second of our two-part salute to Fleetwood Mac on the special of the week. Lindsey experiments with his songs 
in a way that nobody else I ever know has, has ever done. I mean, he can have a basic thing there. It'll be a different song by the time he's, he's happy with it, you know. But that's Christine McVie talking about Lindsay Buckingham. More than anyone else, Lindsay's emerged as Fleetwood Mac's Golden Archer. Not only is his songwriting right on target, but so is his record production. Lindsay started playing with tape recorders as a kid in his father's coffee warehouse when he didn't know beans about recording studios. Today, he has a recording studio in his home. When I work at home, I have no console. I have a 24-track machine and it's a very small thing. One microphone, do everything with miking techniques. Instruments all over the place. Uh, there's a bathroom across the hall, which I use for <laughs> great bathroom sounds. And it's like doing a painting or something. You're just emoting. I don't know if that's a word or not, but it, you just get lost in it for hours and hours on end and don't want to stop. And it's the, the momentum that's involved in it the level of love and doing something that's involved. Lindsay learned to be a record producer the right way by producing hit records right from the start, starting with Walter Egan's Magnet and Steel. I learned a lot doing Walter Egan's album about certain things in the studio. I learned a lot about my own sense of values. It's, it's good. You, can, you get in a group of five people, a microcosm, and, it, and the way you relate is always going to be relative to the other people. So when you extract yourself and put yourself in a different microcosm for a period of time, it shows up a lot of things about yourself that you would think weren't there. Lindsey Buckingham's a veteran of San Francisco's Kingston Trio era, so it's ironic that his next project was with a veteran of the Kingston Trio, John Stewart. I had not met John Stewart, but I have about 20 old Kingston Trio albums at home. <laughs> There's people don't like to admit, very often. <laughs> the credit on that, the producer at large was, was sort of ironic. They had an album out years ago called Kingston Show at Large, and it was sort of a play on the words. And so the whole thing with John Stewart was more a very fair exchange of energy between someone who had given me some energy years ago, and I was able to give it back to him. Since he was busily turning music into gold, it seemed only natural for Lindsay to produce Tusk, Fleetwood Mac's Elephantine double album. Since much of the album was recorded at Lindsay's house, it's got everything, including the kitchen sink and the University of Southern California Trojan marching band. Mick had the brainstorm of taking what we had at that time, which was the song that I had written, more or less the song, if you want to call it that. And Mick said, well, we got to put something weird on this, so... He called up this man whose name is uh, Art Bartner, who is the guy who does the scoring and is the conductor for the USC marching band, and got him out to listen to it. And he was going, what, what is this? Mick and Lindsay got together and said that they wanted uh, a big brass sound. You know, find me the, the biggest, best brass sound that you can. And uh, we kind of pride ourselves on that sound. And then... Uh, they decided on us, and of course we, we jumped at the idea. When you think about it, bringing in 120 musicians to perform with a five-piece group takes a lot of courage. It was a surreal enough event anyway, but walking into Dodger Stadium completely empty and uh, seeing 150 uh, uniformed young people fighting in, going, <laughs> you know, just totally strident and totally into it. It was incredible. Fleetwood Mac, merely a mirror? We'll reflect on that next on the Special of the Week. I'm Robert W. Morgan. I'm Robert W. Morgan on the Special of the Week with Fleetwood Mac. They were written off as a bunch of has-beens just a few short years ago. But today, Fleetwood Mac is one of the world's few true supergroups. Critics have written volumes analyzing their success, but I think the reason behind their phenomenal popularity is that Fleetwood Mac's music is like a mirror reflecting the dreams of their audience. As Lindsey Buckingham says, when you listen to Fleetwood Mac, you're really listening to yourself. Well, I mean, there's a certain amount of honesty and just a certain sense of humanness. I know people respond to that in Stevie songs a lot. And they say, people can feel things not only through lyrics, but just through just the atmosphere of the tracks and everything. Uh, they feel a kinship to things that they have experienced and felt themselves. Because it feels real and it feels honest and it, it feels human. What comes out comes out without a reason. 
visually, Fleetwood Mac has no business being together. No one dresses alike, acts alike, or looks alike. And in concert, they look like five musicians who happen to wander onto the same stage at the same time. Christine McVie believes that with Fleetwood Mac, similarity would breed contempt. We could tell by the response of the audience that this particular formula of the band was very much liked by the public. And I guess maybe the public needed something like us at the time. I mean, you know, I think we were probably the first band to have two frontline female singers. It was an interesting f sort of formula, interesting combination of people. And it still is, really. It's interesting visually as well as in any other way to, to see us. We're all very separate in the way we look. If you look at the way Mick is, and John is, and Stevie is, and I am, and, and Lindsay on stage, all the guys don't have long curly hair, and, you know, and... Everyone is just so radically individual from the other. People are, are basically good, and people are basically going to know something that's good or bad, whether it's on a conscious or unconscious level. People know, you know, they do. I don't think we have to guide them. I think that they want it. I think they're ready for something. I mean, I'm just sick of 90% of the stuff I hear on the radio, and I think everyone else is too. Otherwise, people would still be buying records. And why is there been like, the huge recession in the record industry? It's because there's hardly anything good to listen to. And, okay, so what? People don't have as much money, and there's a, a gas shortage, so people aren't going out as much. And all those things have something to do with it. But it's not going to stop people from going into a store and buying something that they really love and want to buy, you know? And there just hasn't been anything that, that makes people feel, you know? I think that's... That's an indicator that people are tired of the normal sort of thing that uh, is put out these days. Fleetwood Mac say they love you. Next on the special of the week, I'm Robert W. Morgan. I'm Robert W. Morgan with Fleetwood Mac on the special of the week. They've been a blues band, an experimental rock band, and a pop music group. They've seen new members and old friends come and go. They've watched their love lives shatter like old 78 RPM records. But through all those ups and downs, Fleetwood Mac survived. Lindsey Buckingham tells us why. Well, we've all worked for a number of years, you know. And uh, I think we've all seen some ups and downs leading up to, you know, the success. Mick and John were... Fleetwood Mac with Peter Green in England, they were just, I mean, they were like the Beatles for a short period of time over there, were at limousines and just screaming girls and stuff. So they, they've seen that kind of delirium, and then they've seen the real downs, you know, and they've hung on. And we're not kids, none of us are kids either. A lot of bands don't get on the way we get on. And we don't necessarily see each other socially very much at all, but we see each other on a work level so much anyway that we see more of each other than we do of the people you know, friends that we would socialize with. There is no time to socialize. During the past two weeks, we've learned several lessons thanks to Fleetwood Mac. We've learned the value of hard work and persistence. We've learned the virtue of remaining open to change. And we've learned the wisdom of lovers becoming friends. But in the long run, none of these lessons matter. All that matters is the music. Wonderfully written songs performed wonderfully. With Fleetwood Mac, the magic's in the music. And the music will be with us for a long, long time. Which is breaking the seal, as it were, at the moment. I think musically, we've got years ahead of us to experiment and work together. We're just beginning to learn how to work with each other now. It's, it's wonderful. The hot rumor is that we're hot and healthy. The special of the week on Fleetwood Mac was written and produced by Alan Daniel Goldblatt, associate producer Sally Weinstock. Our director was Stu Jacobs, our engineer Ron Shapiro. The special of the week is produced and distributed by Watermark Incorporated. Executive producer Tom Rounds. Next week on the special of the week, meet the man who met the Beatles, record producer George Martin. I wasn't particularly knocked out by them, they were all right, I mean, but uh, the songs weren't very good, and there was something about them that was worthwhile following up, but he didn't make me do handstands against the wall or anything. George Martin, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, next week on the special of the week. 
The special of the week has been brought to you by Michelob. Weekends were made for Michelob. I'm Robert W. Morgan. Thanks for listening. <laughs>